Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. Hello, I'm Bill Robson, CEO of the CD Howard Institute. And I'm Jason Hilchey, President and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association of Canada. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Canada has a long list of shortages of experts in this area. The COVID-19 pandemic intensified the need for digital and STEM skills. The Institute has studied in detail a problem that can hurt business and affect economic growth. Its conclusion, increase the supply of people with digital skills by developing and attracting digital talent and invest in the reskilling and upskilling of the workforce. But how? For insight into this, Bill and Jason join us now. Gentlemen, hello. Hello. Good to be here. Hi, Michael. Jason, you've got a unique vantage point when it comes to the discussion of STEM skills. While the issue is across disciplines from artificial intelligence to automotive, what's the shortage look like to the Entertainment Software Association of Canada? Well, Michael, our industry in Canada right now employs 32,000 full-time direct people, and we support another 23,000 indirect jobs, contributing about $5.5 billion to Canadian GDP. We've been growing at about 10% a year, 20% every couple of years for the last decade. And so uh, talent and skill shortages is something that we've been used to for a long time. But it's become quite critical over the last uh, couple of years, and we've been speaking about this for some time. Uh, to give you a quick example, the uh, industry in Montreal, which is Canada's largest, employs about 13,000 full-time employees, and currently there are about 2,000 job openings there. So that gives you an idea about uh, the number of people that we're looking for right now, about 10 to 15 percent uh, open jobs within the industry. And Bill, can we overall qualify the impact that a STEM, a STEM skills shortage is having on Canada's economy on the whole? Yeah, it's hard. It's tough to quantify on the whole because it is such a pervasive thing. Jason and his uh, the companies that he represents are kind of on the sharp edge in a particular area where the skill demands are especially acute. Uh, the you made the point earlier in your intro that it really it does span a variety of industries, including some that we don't really think of necessarily as digital or even knowledge industries. Um, but the the there's a correlation among countries that you can see going way back uh, between levels of education generally and in, including in STEM skills and overall economic development. Uh, so it's safe to say that um, everywhere that you look where somebody is unable to do things, and sometimes we're not talking about, we're not necessarily talking about coding and video games. Sometimes we're talking about stuff that's way more related to just ability to func function at a basic level in math. Uh, when, when people are unable to do those things, then uh, it's a pervasive productivity problem. So um, the, the list of things that we ought to be looking at is quite long. Uh, some of the things that Jason and his uh, industry need, uh, we need some hasty action there. Uh, when it comes to some of the other things that we're thinking about it, by way of how the education system works, that's going to take longer to fix. Well, what are some of those quick fixes that we can engage in right now? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cede the floor to Jason on this, uh, but the, the one thing that I think is really glaring right now is the way the immigration system has, uh, has, has I'll say, broken down. Um, we had almost no backlog if you go back a few years. The federal government of the day made a big effort to clean that up. Uh, now we've got a horrendous backlog. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, people who are trying to come in as students, and we hope that many of them will stay. Uh, the institutions are deferring now because they can't get their visas. Uh, so, uh, Jason, I'm sure you have uh, even worse stories out of that than what I've been prefiguring. Yeah, Bill, I, I can tell you, though, that over the last uh, five years, the system has been a lot better than it was, at least for our industry. I realize it hasn't been for everyone, but we spent a great deal of time working with the existing federal government to build something called the, the Global Talent Stream, which is a, a high skilled specific stream designed to bring in the best and brightest from around the world in specific, you know, national occupation codes, of which a lot of them apply to the video game industry, it, both from a technical component, as in software engineering and coding, but also 3D uh, uh, modeling, uh, 3D art and graphic design, those types of things. So we have done better with respect to lowering the wait times. Uh, COVID's done some damage to the system. There's no question about that. Uh, the wait times have, have become longer, as I think you know we would expect. But the immigration side of things has always been the quick fix. The problem is 
if I can expand on this a little bit, is that what Michael was saying with respect to COVID really amplifying this requirement for digital skills and, and kind of supercharging the digital economy, this isn't just a Canadian domestic issue. It's happening everywhere. COVID was a global issue, and the digital digitization of the economy is also a global issue. So we can't simply sit back and say, okay, well, we'll bring a lot of immigrants in because all of these other countries are doing things to keep this uh, type of skill set within their own domestic borders because they need to do the same things we need to do. And so we do really need to start focusing on the long-term problem, which is going to be the long-term fix, and that's the education system and other things like micro-credentialing and things that you've talked about in your report. Well, Bill, you know, the Institute has concluded that there really are those two avenues to addressing the skill shortage. You point out the international side, immigration, uh, the domestic side, that the kids today just simply aren't interested in math. What's the solution on the home front? Well, uh, there are a couple of things to say. I, I will, and again, Jason will have a, a view on this. Uh, before we leave international completely, I'll mention immigration. Uh, Canada does lose tens of thousands of people every year. Uh, most of them go to the United States. And the people who go to the United States, it's not a STEM issue particularly, uh, but they tend to be very highly educated, uh, higher earners. So if we could simply do something to help retain more of that talent in Canada, uh, we'd alleviate the problem. Going to education, uh, if you just sort of work backwards in terms of how many years it takes for people to get uh, ready to roll in this area, uh, I would certainly look uh, in the first instance, post-secondary, uh, a lot of the colleges are very market oriented. They're acutely aware that there are shortages in this area. Uh, they're mounting programs. And in a, in a sense, uh, you know, the old bums and seats line, it's really a matter of uh, ensuring that you've got the intake there. I'll say a word just as we work further back, it gets tougher to deal with. Uh, in the elementary and secondary system, and especially elementary school, there just are not very many teachers who have that kind of a background. Uh, so it's tough to teach subjects where you don't have that good a grounding yourself. Developing curriculum that helps them do that, it, it is a long-term uh, process. The ominous thing that we're seeing, Canada by international standards does well in all domains when we look at tests like the ones that the OECD does, uh, but we have been slipping. So there seems to be something wrong, uh, something that we should be addressing with curriculum. And uh, ultimately, we hope getting more teachers in who are comfortable in the area and in, 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 as well as kind of instructing the kids and, and telling them how important this is, uh, maybe modeling a bit more of that kind of comfort and facility with STEM skills that would really motivate the kids. Jason, on that domestic front, you know, are you finding that the schools are just not creating high quality future workers or is it just a function of there aren't enough of them? I'll just seriously uh, bounce off of what Bill just said. I mean, because he's, he's bang on with respect to his assessment. We've been working with organizations, third-party external organizations for a number of years now with respect to uh, trying to get these skills into the school system at an early age. You know, we've worked with organizations like Kids Co. Jeunesse out of Quebec, who've now expanded across Canada. Uh, and then there are other organizations like in Atlanta, Canada with Lighthouse Labs, uh, who, who are essentially third-party STEM code trainers who go into the school system like junior achievement and, and help kind of fill a void that doesn't exist within the curriculum. That was a good start, but it's not where we need to go. I mean, this has been going on now for close to a decade, these types of organizations, and the school system in most provinces still hasn't adapted to bring their own curriculum changes in to get these types of you know, basic computational thinking and coding, like things just as simple as if I do this, this person moves here, or, you know, we need to move this person from point A to point B. How do I do that? What would an algorithm look like that allows me to do that? I mean, the United Kingdom got rid of their Microsoft Office uh, computer training back in about 2010 and instituted uh, computer skills through software engineering and we still haven't done that. And so it's a, it's a long generational change. But if I could leave you with one anecdote on this, it's that, you know, I've been in this business for about 15 years. And the first five years that I was in it, I was working for the government in Nova Scotia and economic development, trying to build this industry there. And over the years, I've spoken with many deans of computer science programs, not just there, but across the country. And the one thing that sticks out is they have a common narrative, which is they get kids from two different streams. The first is, like you say, is the kid that is good at math and doesn't know what they want to do with their life. And their parents have told them that because they're good at math, they can make a lot of money becoming a computer software engineer. 
And so they take computer science and they do quite well with that. The second is the kid that essentially trains themselves in their basement, you know, when making their own video games or their own apps or their own uh, software programs. Uh, and they learn it that way. And then they get into computer science. Neither of those <laughs> are, are, they're both random. Neither of them are actually linear with respect to bringing our kids from the high school uh, side of things into college. So when you go into university and if you, you wanted to take biology, you had the opportunity to take biology in grades 10, 11, and 12 before you even take biology in first year university. Barely anywhere in Canada, if anywhere, you can take computer science before you actually take computer science at university. That's a problem. What we need are more dots connecting those kids in elementary school to actual curriculum changes in the high school that lead people into computer science and computational engineering programs in the university and post-secondary world. Michael, I wonder if I could just come in on that and say that uh, sometimes this type of thing can seem like an awfully big ask, especially if you look at uh, the the you know teachers who are motivated to do this but may not be that comfortable in it. I would stress the importance of a lot of the basic stuff. Um, you know, kids may or may not be able to learn Python. Uh, you know, in, in early in uh, elementary school, uh, possibly if they did, it'd be like when uh, uh, my generation uh, learned COBOL or something. Uh, uh, but uh, the, it, the 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 value of the of the basic math skills, uh, having comfort. Uh, Jason referred to this. Uh, some of the computational skills, some of the logical thinking that comes along with that. Some people think you can maybe get a lot of that through music training, other ways as well. Uh, there is just that foundation that we need to make sure that we're laying. And sometimes uh, when we look at areas of the population that just don't seem to be attracted to STEM, uh, I think sometimes that's the problem. It's just the, the, it's a little bit like if, if you suddenly had some great work of literature put in front of you, but you'd never properly learned to read in the first place. Uh, you, you're just not able to engage with it and go anywhere with it. Well, let's expand upon that because it, we're not just talking here about reforming the education system so that teachers have more modern curricula and that they themselves can engender a sense of energy into the topics. It's about gender balance. I recently spoke to Deutsche Telekom about this issue and was told that there continues to be a cultural disconnect. German women get asked, how are you going to balance your career and your family? Men don't get that question. So to what degree in Canada is the STEM gender divide cultural versus educational? Mm -hmm. Jason, do you want to, I, I don't know if I should put you on yeah. the line of that. Your industry sometimes comes under the microscope there. It does. And and that's why you can put me under under the, the microscope here because I answer this question a lot. You know, it's it's really interesting because if you look at our player base and every, every couple of years we do research to quantify what our player base looks like, who's playing games, why are they playing, what what do they play, everything from you know, what, what's the difference between what young girls play to what young boys play to what retired men and, and middle-aged uh, women play? And, you know, our player base is, is almost consistently 50-50 between uh, females and males, but it doesn't really tell the whole story. I mean, it's different types of games. You know, a lot of, uh, of females like mobile games on, on the subway. A lot of males are playing console games, more immersive games. But that, at one point in time, we thought that that was going to help us attract more people into the industry. So if we can get our player base more diverse, then that'll get more females and, and women interested in video games and maybe they'll get into. That really hasn't happened. You know, we quantify the people that work in our industry as well through an economic study that we do. And, you know, our percentage of women uh, who are, are, are coding is abysmal. I mean, it's, it's about 10% uh, of the whole workforce and we need to do better than that. But the issue is, is that one, our industry needs to do better. Uh, there's no question. And I'm not trying to pass the buck on that at all. Like, far none. We have to do better. But the ability to do better for us and for most technology industries is dependent on the pipeline of talent that's coming out of the school system. Okay. So if you talk to a lot of these deans of computer science, their enrollment of females is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the entire class. So, you know, on the higher level, 15% would be the highest we'd ever be able to get for computer software engineers. And not all of them are going to join the video game industry. A lot of them are going to go and do different things. And so I really do believe that, you know, as much as we can do as an industry, we still do need to reach young girls at a much younger age 
before technology becomes stereotypically masculine. Uh, get them interested in this type of thing uh, before the you know culturally becomes taboo for them, and help get them and lead them into. Uh, uh, those post-secondary uh, programs that will lead them into the industry because it, it, it's a chicken and the egg, right? It, it needs to happen both both ways. Well, then, now, now, thank you for your under the microscope comment. Uh, taking a slightly uh, broader focus, Michael, if I could, uh, there is a cultural aspect to it. I think uh, when you look at retention, just in the education system, it seems as though women, for example, don't. Uh, uh, necessarily complete the courses at the same rate. So something's happening to them that's disillusioning them. But one of the, maybe it'll be helpful for me to just say uh, that I think the early comments we made about the knowledge economy being broader than what people often conceive, maybe that's part of the image issue that we face. I mean, if you're attracted by health sciences nowadays, and that's a field where women uh, are attracted and are, and are becoming quite dominant in many fields, that's that, that's a knowledge industry where digital skills matter a great deal. So I think it's partly a matter of just helping people visualize the various places that might they might want to go in life and realize these are skills that are going to help you in a wide range of uh, occupations and in your personal life. So, Bill, the study advises us to invest in upskilling and reskilling the existing workforce. What should that look like? That's a, what that should look like is a, a longstanding debate because governments have often uh, had various types of training programs, uh, including in the past when the unemployment rate was high and it was very uh, disturbing to see uh, large parts of the population that didn't seem to be able to engage in the workforce. My quick sense of the experience in that area is that sort of classroom training, not necessarily so effective. If you can support people as they're getting into the workforce, uh, help the employers, and Jason's just been emphasizing this, how tight the labor market is, they're looking for talent. Uh, and they're probably ready to look for it in places where previously they would have thought it's a bit unpromising because the shortages are so severe. Uh, anything that helps people come into contact with them, uh, gets them that on-the-job training, that experience. Co-op programs, for example, in education seem to be very powerful when it comes to people then being able to get into the workforce and hit the ground running. I, I some of the training programs of the past that you think of, you know, sort of bureaucratic atmosphere, people sitting uh, in a room, uh, probably not so effective. Anything that gets them in contact with the employer and contact with the workforce, that's what really makes the difference. And we've talked in the past as well that a lot of upskilling uh, falls on the companies at which these employees already work. And the best way to improve the overall capabilities of any given workforce is to work from within. Well, that's true. And I, I'm going to throw to Jason here because one of the problems that you find in any industry where you're worried that there's not enough on-the-job training happening is that there might be an element of, well, if we train somebody up uh, and, and then we make that a big investment in them, then they go to work for a competitor. Well, then, then you know, what was it all for? Uh, one of the things that industry associations such as Jason's can do is kind of internalize that. It's a problem everybody has. And so if the whole industry is making efforts that are complementary, then you worry less that you're going to, uh, you know, do the training that somebody else is going to benefit from because it's all staying in the pool. Yeah, I think if you're a good employer and you're committed to your employees, then you're going to invest in them regardless. There's always the risk that they're going to leave. Um, it, it, you know, I don't think that uh, you should take the approach that, you know, if I train them up, they're going to leave. Uh, I think that the approach would be I'm going to train them up and they're going to stay because they value what it is that we're doing. And I think, you know, a lot of the, the companies in our industry do a lot of upskilling and they do a lot of continuing education. And, you know, that's not really as big of an issue as going back to the core topic here, which is, uh, you know, knowledge transfer and changing. So if you come from one career, let's say you work in the forestry industry or the lumber industry and you lose your job uh, and you want to, you know, upskill and, and learn how to be a computer uh, coder, that is much more difficult, right? Because, you know, the skill set is so different. Most people are mid-career. They have to learn a new skill from scratch. Now, governments have spent a lot of time, I believe, across Canada, especially with the, you know, those provinces that own uh, their own community college network, uh, oftentimes will subsidize or completely uh, 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 grant free tuition for people to go back and, and reskill, and I think that's fantastic. So the government does play a large role in that. The, the challenge is, is that it, 
you know, for our industry, for instance, in, in many cases, our, our members are making games that cost upwards of $100 million a year and, or $100 million to make. And so they're looking for the best talent that they can to make those games because our, our players, our consumers are very, uh, they have high expectations and they demand high quality. Just like people who watch movies very shortly after the game is launched, you know, aggregate uh, review scores start popping up and, you know, it, it influences sales. So it's very, very pressure oriented to get the game right and get it out there in a, in a, in a way that's uh, got a high level of quality. And so you need the best people. Getting there's a there's a divide there, and I'm not saying this is happening in every case, but when you when you reskill somebody and you just give them a diploma or you you know they they finish course doesn't necessarily mean that they can do the job. So what you were saying, Bill, about getting real world training, getting these internships, getting these co ops, you know those learning on the job, those, especially in the technology industry, that's really where you're going to to learn a lot of the skills that are, are needed. I mean, you still need the basics, but you really do need to get into the companies. And so reskilling is something that is uh, something we absolutely need to talk about, but it's not that panacea that's going to fix everything, unfortunately. I wish it was, but it's it's not. We touched on this sort of at the beginning, the, the, the fear of a repeat of the brain drain of the internet boom of the 2000s. What's the solution here? Uh, I don't know who, Jason, do you want to go after that one? No, I, I'd actually like to hear your, your opinion first, and then I'll... Uh, <laughs> you step into that breach first. Yeah, it, it, industry, you know, the, the, some of the booms and busts that happen in industries happen because of developments within the industry themselves. You know, railways, well, a lot of track gets laid, and uh, uh, then you don't need so much of it. Uh, in in the case of the tech industry, I think some of what's happened is that there has been there have been varying degrees of financing available. Uh, you know, it's the flavor of the month, and then people move on to something else. Uh, so, to some extent, I think the cycles of the past were not really things that happened. You know, from from within the industry, um, because we're talking about talent, I would focus on the on the more long term phenomena here. Uh, human capital takes a while to develop. Uh, and uh, and also the overall economic dynamism of Canada, uh, particularly, I think, is an issue here. So it's not something that's so much related to one industry as it is uh, the degree to which we're building the talent. Uh, we've got business investment writ large is a concern for me. One of the things that concerns me in Canada is uh, that we're not investing in a lot in uh, intangibles and, and digital technology to anything like the same extent that is happening in the United States, for example. Uh, so that whole ecosystem, it's a slower moving thing. Um, but in general, I'd say, uh, notwithstanding the booms and busts in the past, and going back to the earlier comments about the fact that the knowledge economy and the digital economy is quite a bit more broad than than often what pops to mind, um, I think that this is an imperative uh, and and uh, even some of the things that will take the longest to do, like paying attention to the math curriculum in the early grades, uh, those, that, those are investments that are going to pay off. Yeah, and, and I mean, from, from the video game industry's perspective, I'll start there, is the, we're so fortunate in Canada to have one of the largest video game industries in the world. I mean, we produce some of the best and biggest uh, selling games, most well-known brands all around the world. We sell our games to every country. And, you know, when you talk Canada in the video game industry, and this is why I'm so fortunate to be in this job, is everyone immediately knows that it. It's major, it's big games, it's big industry, it's, you know, government support, it's all these things together. And so, you know, at least directly within our industry, we see a lot more people kind of coming into Canada to work in the games industry than we see leaving. I mean, we don't quantify that, but just from a you know, anecdotal perspective, like a lot of people want to move to Canada to work on, you know, big games like FIFA and Assassin's Creed and you know, Mass Effect and, and other things that, you know, are, are well-known video games. Now, um, you know, from uh, from a, an investment perspective, you know, I think that back in the dot-com era, Canada's technology industry was far from what it is today. Uh, you know, we're talking, you know, if you wanted to work in, in IT at the time, you know, it was Nortel and then it became BlackBerry. And, you know, you didn't have the broad-based technology industry you know, that startup technology industry that you have now. I mean, with, with all of the venture capital, the government funds, the private funds, 
you know, even the economic development agencies and the government agencies that have done well getting large multinationals to uh, invest in Canada, like Amazon and IBM and, you know, all sorts of different companies. There are just so many opportunities now to stay and live in Canada and work in the technology industry. You don't have to go to Silicon Valley. You know, you don't have to go to California. And I think that even though in some cases those people will choose to do it, and that's a personal choice for them, uh, you know, sometimes they always end up coming home anyway. Uh, and, and that's good for our industry. You know, that's good for Canada because they've been trained in the U.S. and then they come back and they're ready to go to work. But those that do want to stay, there's lots of opportunities for them. And, uh, you know, even though we're seeing a bit of a blip right now with some layoffs in the tech space and some, some, some pullback, it, you know, like everything, you know, it, it comes and goes and, it, and this will pass. Uh, but we, we can't stop investing now, like Bill says. We have to continue to invest. And, in, you know, even though it's a difficult time and an unstable time out there, the worst thing we could do is pull back and, and not invest in innovation, technology, and talent. So then, Bill, with that in mind, let's bring this full circle back and lean on your public policy expertise. What is the Institute's best advice to government at the federal level? And what's the Institute's best advice on how to deal with all of this at the various provincial levels? Well, at the federal level, uh, I would focus on keeping Canada attractive to talent uh, and the uh, levers that the federal government can pull. At the moment, they're into giving away money. Uh, and you can do that intelligently, but it's uh, a very fraught business. Um, and government subsidy programs don't have a terrific record of success. And as a bit of a fiscal warrior, uh, I hesitate to recommend any business plan that relies on long-term government subsidies right now, because I think that spigot is uh, going to get turned off and might stay off for a while. Uh, the thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that it's easy for people with talent to get in. And then you want a balance of taxes and other things that are going to make them happy to stay here. Provincially, I would go to the education system. Uh, the provinces, I think, have done by and large a good job of, uh, of of supporting a college sector that's very market responsive. And uh, I hope Jason agrees with me on this. He didn't he didn't express a view otherwise. I think that the post secondary institutions, on the whole, have done a pretty nice job of responding to what the students want and what they're hearing from employers and what they're seeing in the job market. Uh, so then, working further upstream, it really is important to make sure that. Uh, the students that are coming out of the elementary and secondary system are comfortable in that world. Uh, they know they're not afraid of math. Uh, they're able to do the basic things that they need to do. Uh, with any luck, they've had some exposure to teachers who were enthusiastic about it and gave them a bit of a vision for where they might be able to go with this. I would really be thinking about, though, you know, getting those scores on the, the provincial tests and the PISA uh, scores up. So that Canada continues to shine when it comes to its its ability in these areas. If you're doing that right, a lot of other things are going to come out right. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Thank, thank you. you. Jason Hilchey is the president and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association of Canada. And Bill Robson is the chief executive officer of the CD Howe Institute. Still to come from the CD Howe. Open House, who should have access to property listing data? A webinar with REMAX President Christopher Alexander, Paul Johnson, formerly of the Competition Bureau of Canada, and Lauren Ha, the CEO of Zucasa Realty. That's September 29th. On October 3rd, putting principles into practice, regulation in today's changing capital markets. A roundtable luncheon at the Young Street headquarters in Toronto with Grant Vingo, the CEO of the Ontario Securities Commission. And later that evening, a patron circle dinner, cool heads in hot times, three former ambassadors on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.